Well, good morning, Oakwood family. I'm so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, so excited to uh, be a part of God's church. Uh, here at Oakwood, we are a church that is growing to know, love, and live Jesus. We know him with our minds, with our heads. We love him with our hearts. We serve him with our hands. And uh, man, this morning, we're just praying that God would touch your heart uh, from his word this morning. And uh, we've been in this series, uh, this is the third week for 24, as we're looking at the last 24 hours of the life of Jesus Christ and going through different things. So let me bring you up to speed on where we're at today. We started with Jesus and the disciples in the upper room, and uh, he was teaching them, using that as an opportunity, and telling them that he was leaving, but that that was a good thing because the Holy Spirit was going to come after him and so it was good that he was leaving the holy spirit was going to come and then at the end of that last week we talked about communion we talked about the lord's supper at the last supper with the disciples and how uh, god uh, began that uh, lord's supper that communion time where we get to commune with with jesus christ and we talked about all the ramifications of that for us today um, and what it means and, and why we do it and how we do it and all those things so um, and then now we're to that part where the dinner is over and they leave the upper room now i uh, as I was writing this, it, it reminded me of being a, a youth minister a long, long time ago. When I was a youth minister, I always had this rule. I always shared it with students, and I also shared it with a lot of parents through the years when I was in youth ministry. And that was this. Nothing good happens after dark. Nothing good happens after dark. In fact, I drilled down, down on that a, a little bit further and said, really, nothing good ever, ever happens after midnight. So by midnight, kids should be in their beds, you know, uh, asleep. Um, there should nothing good happens after dark. And if you think about that, about 85% of crime is committed after dark. Bad things happen after dark. In fact, if you think about your sinfulness, if you're trying to hide your sin, you're not doing your sin and committing your sin in the light where everyone can see it, you're, you're what? You're doing it under a cover of darkness and trying to keep it in the dark. And sometimes it's at night where we see a prevalence of evil. We see a prevalence of, of, of people that begin to struggle with their decisions on whether they're going to serve God or serve themselves. And it's in this tension that we pick up the story now with Jesus in the last 24 hours of his life. So again, he's been in the upper room. He's just finished the Last Supper, Holy Communion with his friends. He's brought all that meaning into that. And now they are heading to a garden to pray. It's a garden called Gethsemane. Now, I have a little map up here just to kind of illustrate this for you visually. So um, the upper room traditionally is in that bottom left corner. And then you see the red arrows start. And they go out of the lower gate, out of the city gate. They actually go through the Kidron Valley, over toward the road that leads to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this little jaunt is happening in the dark, more than likely. It's past sunset. They've shared the upper room experience. They are now walking, and they're walking this pathway in the dark. If you were to step that out and understand it as much as I could read and gather from biblical times, that was about a mile and a half to two miles to get there to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, what has happened before we read the text from today is that on that uh, walk, Jesus has had some conversations with the disciples, and one of them is the famous exchange between him and one of his disciples named Peter. Peter uh, is walking with Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, you know, make sure that you uh, uh, don't give in to temptation, make sure you follow me, and Peter's like, oh, oh, Jesus, I'll never turn my back on you, I'll never betray you, I would never do something like that. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, before the rooster crows three times in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's emphatic. He's like, oh, no, Jesus, I would never, ever betray you. I would never, you know, abandon you. Um, but on, that is all happening. That conversation is happening on this walk as we get into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we're going to pick up our text today, beginning in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36, as always, you're welcome to follow along in the app, follow along in your Bible. We want you to engage the Word of God this morning. There's also an outline in the bulletin. We'd love for you to pull that out and fill that out as we go this morning. 
Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, <clears throat> and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that'd be James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Did you catch that? Jesus is feeling the weight of the situation he's going to be in very, very soon. We would take quite seriously today if someone said, hey, I'm overwhelmed and sorrowful even to the point of death. What would we do? The crisis, you know, bells and whistles would be going off in our mind. We would want to take action. We'd want to be there for that friend in their time of need, right? Let's read on. 39, going a little farther, he fell to his face on the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now we read, we read throughout this passage, Jesus keeps talking about this cup, and let me explain what that is. This cup is the cup of suffering, because Jesus knows everything he's going to have to suffer to save the world. And so he's praying to the Father here, and when he says, hey, that this cup could be taken from me, that I don't have to suffer all of these things, Lord, is there any other way to save the world by your will and your plan and your way other than me suffering like this? That's the cup that he's talking about there. Verse 40, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Nice, good friends. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's talking to Peter there because I've just had that conversation of, oh, I'll never deny you, Jesus. Verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. That never, that never happens during a sermon to any of you, does it? Just, okay. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Folks, we're getting to the action sequences there will be no rest for the weary. Now, what I've done this morning, it's a little different than what we normally do, is this next part, and if you look at your subheading, if you're following along in Scripture, it probably says Jesus is arrested, um, something like that. For this arrest sequence, what I've done is I wanted to read this chronologically. What I mean by that is there's four Gospels. All four Gospels hold this account of Jesus' arrest in the garden. It's, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what I've done is I've leaned into a resource by a really, really wise man named Mark Moore. He wrote a, wrote a book called The Chronological Life of Christ, where we put all this in order because Matthew's got some details, and Mark's got some details, and Luke's got some details, and John. It's all the same thing, but each one adds a little detail, and I didn't want to miss it. So what we've done is on the back of, if you've got a bulletin and you've got that insert, on the back of it, you'll see a lot of words. That's what I'm going to read next. This is chronologically put together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the arrest sequence for Jesus. Because I just don't want us to miss anything uh, with us this morning. So let's read that right now. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, and he crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas, one of the twelve, came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders of the people and Pharisees while Jesus was still speaking. And they were carrying torture, torches and lanterns, weapons, swords, and clubs. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you want? Well, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Now, you have to understand, you're like, well, didn't they know what he looked like? Folks, it's dark. 
Okay? It, we just read that they had this battalion come and they were, hoard, they were holding torture, torches and lanterns. It's hard to see. Okay, so they, that's why, you know, Jesus walks right out to them, you know, and he says, hey, who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And, and, and they're still not sure it's him. Even if they've seen him teach, even if they've seen him around, it's dark. So just remember that context. He says, G, they said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with him. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. Talking about the disciples there. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those that you gave me. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And with that, one of Jesus' companions, Simon Peter, reached for a sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Folks, he wasn't aiming for the ear. Peter was going to take off his head. He just missed in the dark. The servant's name was Malchus. No more of this. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Do you think I cannot call on my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen this way? And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you come with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you in the temple courts teaching and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. As we understand this text this morning, I want you to understand this about Jesus. Jesus is 100% human. He's 100% God. He's also 100% human. That means that all of the torture that he's going to suffer in the, in the few hours after this passage, he feels it like you and I would feel it. All of the betrayals that happen, all of his friends abandoning him, all that, all of those feelings of where are my people when I need them, all of those things, Jesus is feeling every single part of that. He feels every part of these circumstances. So I want you to think for just a moment, what is Jesus, the Son of God, the 100% human, just like you and me, feeling? Because he's tried to tell his best friends that he's leaving. And no one really understands. He knows what lies ahead, and he petitions his father about another way. He's being betrayed by one of his best friends for money. He asks his friends to stay awake and then to pray with him, and they all fall asleep. They are not there for him when he needs them the most. And he is so stressed out that in one of the gospel accounts, it actually says that at Gethsemane, when he was praying, he leaned on a rock and he was sweating blood. I'd say that Jesus was having a pretty good night, right? Jesus is feeling the pressure by this point. The pressure of what he's going to face as he takes on the sin of all of the world. Imagine the burden. He's feeling pressed. He's feeling pressured. And it's interesting that as he's praying this, and that first passage we read from Matthew 26, is that it happens in the garden called Gethsemane. Do you know what Gethsemane means? 
It means oil press, where Jesus was feeling pressed on and pressured by the weight of the world. It's also interesting that it happens in a garden. Gardens in the Bible. Where, where does the Bible... Oh, yeah, the Bible begins... That's right. The Bible begins in a garden. And, and, you know, we read Scripture, so many people are like, Oh, what a coincidence. That's really cool. Guys, this is not a coincidence. Because wasn't it in a garden that Adam and Eve brought sin and death to mankind by their disobedience? And here it is in a garden where God's salvation plan begins to be worked out and it's brought on by Jesus through righteousness that he gives life to mankind by his obedience. And it's in a garden that we find the fall of mankind away from God. It's in the garden we find mankind's way back to God. And guess what? In Revelation 22 at the end of the Bible, we're back in a garden. It is Eden restored as God intended it from the beginning of Genesis. But all of this is only possible if Jesus will be the sacrifice for our sins. If Jesus is willing to take the hit for us and is willing to die. And I bet in his flesh Jesus wanted to forget this night all together. But I think through reading this passage and reading the chronological part today, we can attain some great insights into how Jesus handled extremely tough circumstances. How, how did he handle life when it seemed like everything was working against him? And we see it in the anguish and in the angst in which he's crying out to God. How did Jesus handle his ridiculously hard circumstances? I want to share several thoughts with you this morning. First one is this. Jesus prayed before he entered the fray. Jesus prayed before he entered the fray. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a pattern in his life. Before teaching, Jesus prayed. Before crowds, Jesus prayed. Before miracles, Jesus prayed. Before the day began, the scripture tells us that many times while it was still dark, Jesus withdrew to a lonely place to pray to his heavenly Father. And that's why I say to Christians, anytime we talk about prayer, is that Prayer needs to be our first response and not our last resort. And yet, if we're honest, how many times do we pray first? Or do we pray at the end? Do we pray last? Do we just pray as a last resort? And so it was not strange for Jesus to pray. Now, if you think about this, and if you're with us the last couple of weeks, at the end of the Upper Room Discourse in John ch chapter 17, Jesus gives what's called the high priestly prayer. He's praying over his disciples. He's praying about their relationship with God. And he gives that prayer where he says, oh, Heavenly Father, that they could be one with you as you and I are one. I and them, them and me. He's prayed in the upper room. He's prayed over that Passover meal. He's prayed over communion. He gives his prayer at the end. They walk outside. They're in the dead of night. And he goes to a garden to do what? Before he's arrested, before the trials in the night, before the torture that he's going to face. What is it? He goes to pray. Don't miss that. Pray. Talk to God. Second thing, Jesus gets real about what's real. Jesus gets real about what's real. Did you, did you catch that in all the texts that we read? Jesus is laying it all out there. There's no fakey Christianity. You know, it's like, oh, Lord, bless me and keep me and keep me safe. And, you know, please give me a blessing. And no, there's no prayers like that. Jesus, Jesus is 100% here crying out to God, laying it all out. I think it's wise for Christians here that we would practice the same. Jesus is getting real about what? Fear. 
He's getting really real about the worry. He's getting real about feeling pressed in that situation and the suffering, the angst, the stress, and the betrayal. And he lays all of that out before the Lord. And when he asks God, Scripture says that he sweats blood when he asks him. When was the last time you prayed sweating blood? Sometimes, folks, I just think we need to get really real before God. If you try to dress up your prayers in some King James language, oh, thy Lord, thy bounty thou hast put before us. I mean, he's not impressed by that. He's impressed by you being real, you being genuine, you being authentic. And he would love for that to rub off on some other people in your family, your friends, in your growth group. Jesus gets really real. And Jesus gets real because he knows two things about his heavenly father. The first one is this. God has a plan. Jesus knows God has a plan. God has a plan. If you've been doing the Bible reading with us and you've been in the Bible app, we're now in Joshua. And isn't it amazing as we're reading Joshua in the very first few chapters here, what's amazing to me, what keeps sticking out, God has a plan. God has a plan. It's always better than man's plan. Man tries to work around God's plan, man messes it up every single time. And yet God has a plan and it's awesome. God knows what he's doing. God is sovereign over all things. God is on the throne of heaven. God is God. And Jesus knows my heavenly father's got a plan. The second thing is that God can handle his outcry. The son of God says, heavenly father, if there's any way that this cup of suffering could pass from me. If there's any other way to save the world, but, but not my will, not my plan, your will be done. And sweating blood is so intense that Jesus is crying out to the Heavenly Father. And I just want you to know, when you are praying, God can handle your outcry too. When you're disappointed with God, when you have questions for God, you bring those to the Lord. Jesus cries out because he knows his heavenly father can handle it. Folks, you can cry out too. Because I know sometimes that's what you feel like doing. Sometimes you're, you're, you're doing life and it's a mess and it's hard. I just want to encourage you, go to God, bring it to God, cry out to God. Jesus did. Third thing this morning, Jesus shows supreme confidence and trust in God. He shows supreme confidence and trust in God. We read that Jesus went out to meet them. Did you catch that in our text? I'm thinking, I'm gonna hunker down here in the grove of trees and kind of hide out and see if they can catch me, you know? And they're looking in all the bushes everywhere. Wait, did you hear something? You know, uh, no. Jesus says, hey, here come my betrayers. We're going to walk out and we're going to meet them. And I'm going to ask, them, I'm going to speak first. We read this in Mark 14, 41 and 42. Jesus said, the hour has come. Look, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer and I'm meeting him head on. Why? Because Jesus had supreme confidence and trust in God, and he shows his confidence, his boldness, his courage in the circumstance, even in the face of adversity, even when he knew this only means bad things for you, Jesus, this only means trouble for you, Jesus, even in the midst of that, Jesus says, head on, here we go, let's roll. And I really, I want to pause here and just have you consider something this morning. As you're going through your life, where is your confidence? Where is your confidence? Is your confidence in God? Or is your confidence in yourself? I mean, really think about that. Is your confidence in God or is your confidence in yourself? Maybe your confidence is in another human, but let me remind you, as humans, we make terrible gods. But where... Are you really putting your confidence? Do you put your confidence in your plans? You say, well, I've got some plans, and you know, I've been talking to my spouse. We've got our plans together here. 
And are you confident in your future because they're your plans? Or are you confident in your future because of God's plans? You see, when Jesus shows supreme confidence and trust, it's in the Lord. His confidence is in the Lord and in the Lord's plan. Fourth thing this morning. Jesus shows the supernatural power of God. Even as 100% human here, Jesus shows the supernatural power of God. It is supernatural. Some of the things that happen, that's why I wanted to read this text with all the details in it from all of the Gospels. And I don't know if you caught this earlier, but let's go back. And we're, It's actually in John's Gospel. Let's go back and read part of John's Gospel. As Jesus asks the group who they're looking for. John 18, 4 through 6 is where it's found. Jesus knowing all that would happen to him. That blows my mind right there. Jesus knows all that's going to happen. Jesus knew he's going to be whipped. Yep. Falsely accused. Yep. False trials all night. Yep. Jesus knew all of those things. Jesus knowing all that was going to happen to him. He went out. <laughs> and he asked, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And what does he say? I am he. Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with him. And when Jesus said it, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. I am amazed and floored at this verse. I am so glad it is included here in John's gospel. There's something amazing that happens here. Jesus speaks. And the mob that is about to arrest him, that is going to make fun of him, that is going to beat him and mistreat him, the mob that will whip him and torture him and crucify him bows down. And this isn't some accidental thing. It reminded me of the verse uh, in God's word in Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him, being Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee. We read in other places in Scripture where it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We're all someday all of us going to bow down to Jesus. And when you give your heart and your life and your allegiance to him right now, you are bowing down your life before him. And this is what he requires. Everyone will bow down someday to the Lord, but we have the choice. Do we bow down now or do we bow down when he comes again, when it's too late to enjoy life with him forever. You had better decide whether you will call him Lord and bow down now before it's too late. Now this word bow down, when we read it in English, the way the translation comes across, the Greek word is fell to the ground in English, fell to the ground. Okay, if you look up that word in the original Greek language, it's a, it's a cute little word, it's pipto. P-I-P-T-O is would be the English translation of it. Pipto, cute little word, right? Listen to what pipto means. Fell to the ground, pipto, which means to fall from a straight up position to a prostrate position, to be thrust down, to fall down as in rendering homage or worship to someone. Folks, this mob worshiped Jesus. Supernatural power of God. This mob that's going to nail him on a cross and beat him, they worshiped. They bowed down. This is an amazing demonstration. And how did they respond? How did Jesus respond? Did you catch it? Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And he answers, and I'm doing my best Charlton Heston here. I am he. Did you catch that? Jesus' response? I am he. Whew, fall down worship. Do you remember the part from that story? Moses says, I'm going to Pharaoh in Egypt. Well, God, what, what should I tell him your name is? And God says, <laughs> I am. <laughs> I just think it's interesting that Jesus responds twice here with, I am he in the flesh. I'm God. Supernatural. It's only 
because Jesus was willing to carry out God's divine plan of redemption and sacrifice himself on the cross. This is an amazing demonstration of his power that clearly reveals they did not seize Jesus. Jesus willingly gave himself over. He had them on their knees face down. He could have said, Peter, be a better aim. Get after it, brother. He didn't. Jesus willingly took on the cross. He willingly took the beating. He willingly took the torture for us. And it's in these moments where sometimes the world reads these Bible texts and they perceive this as its, its weakness. It's, you know, it's this perceived weakness of Jesus. But I think Jesus is actually showing the greatest power of God and strength because he didn't fight back. He could have. He had won. He could have called 10, 12 legions of angels. But he knew God is in control. He has a salvation plan. I'm going to believe in him, but let me just show you a little supernatural power that shows you God's still in control. Huh. I am. Bow down. Thanks for the reminder. Last thing. Jesus shows supreme obedience. Supreme obedience, even when Jesus accepts the kiss of a traitor. A supreme obedience. Now the betrayer had, sig had arranged this signal for them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Friend, do what you came for. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. That kiss, if you look at the word in the original language, is this word phileo. It's a verb referring to an act of special affection and respect. Such a kiss was a sign of homage that you would pay to someone. It was a sign of close affection for someone. And so, understand that Judas, of all the signals he could have picked to point out to this guard of who Jesus was, of all the things he could have selected, he chose the one that was the most despicable. Imagine how that felt to Jesus. And yet he shows supreme obedience because he allows it to happen. And you may say, why? Well, Jesus knew the plan. <laughs> and Jesus willingly laid down his life. Willingly. There's, it's, folks, it's no wonder they call him Savior. You see, through it all, Jesus surrendered what we need to surrender. It's our will and our way to the Heavenly Father. Jesus was a model of surrender here. He, he surrenders to the guard. We're, we're going to read, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see some more times where Jesus is still operating in surrender to God's plan, to his will, and to his ways. And I want to ask you this morning, have you surrendered? It's interesting that the word surrender has some imagery that goes with it. When they used to fight wars, it became a custom that when they're fighting wars and then one group was going to give up and they were going to surrender to the other one, they were done fighting, they lost too many soldiers, like they, they just knew this is futility at this point, we are going to surrender, they would put up the white flag. They'd grab a, a t-shirt or whatever they could find, they would, they would put it on a stick or a pole, and they would wave this white flag, and that was a signal to the people that were coming against them that we surrender. And folks, that's what Jesus wants this morning. He wants you to get out your white flag and surrender to him. Surrender your life, surrender your will, your ways. Some of you have this past, and you hate it. You hate talking about it. You hate thinking about it. And Jesus says, put up the white flag. Just put up the white flag and surrender. I will take on all of that for you. I already did on the cross. Our response is, Jesus, you paid the price. And so I surrender to you.